bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, college football edition. And while we grinned and bared it during what was anything but an exciting card on paper last week, the college football scheduling gods have smiled fondly upon all of us with not one, not two, but seven marquee matchups that we'll get to in some level of detail on today's show. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my college football cohorts and colleagues, Brad Powers and Payne Insider. And gentlemen, we got a lot of work in front of us today, a lot of marquee matchups and an excited listenership to hear your great perspective on things. Yeah, I mean, it's the, I, I would argue it's the week we've been waiting for uh, so far this college football season. There hasn't been a lot of marquee matchups. Um, in my opinion, some data points uh, that, that left a, a little bit to be desired this week. Hopefully, we get those data points and we really start seeing you know who the true contenders are at the top of the sport. It's always interesting, boys. Both of you have proud programs that you're attached to with measuring stick games this weekend. So curious to get your take on those contests. But with so much ground right in front of us, may as well dive right into the games themselves. And we can start things off in Clemson, South Carolina, where Florida State goes on the road as less than a field goal favorite total on the game in the low 50s or mid 50s, I should say, right around 54 and a half, boys. And when you look at the program pedigree on full display, these two programs have accounted for 13 ACC championship game appearances over the last 14 years. The teams have combined for 11 of the past 12 ACC titles. And given the current construct of the conference, probably would have played a lot more frequently than that if they weren't in the same division. Florida State will head to Death Valley looking for its first win over Clemson since 2014. The last time Clemson played a top five team and it was not also a top five team and when you look at this spot Clemson will go into this game as a home underdog the last time they were in this role it was Heisman Trophy winner or eventual Heisman Trophy winner Lamar Jackson coming into their building Clemson and getting the best of it and Lamar Jackson taking home the hardware at the end of the season and we'll break things up for, as we will for a lot of these games allow you guys to attack one side of the ball so Payne we'll come to you first when we look at this Florida State offense obviously Florida State fans last weekend you know held their breath when Jordan Travis went down to the turf at Chestnut Hill got up was able to finish the <laughs> game we saw him as a willing and able runner later in that contest but outside of Jordan Travis health which seems like a logical place to start the biggest thing for Florida State when you watch them through a couple of games the passing attack has shown big play capabilities. We'll keep Keon Coleman's rant on social media to a minimum, but this team, if they're going to go on the road in hostile territory, has to show more concerted effort and consistency when it comes to running the football. Okay. First of all, I know you're big on the emoji. Oh, 100%. 100%. I love internal drama. I love internal drama. Well, I I think it's what you... The other day, you know, two weeks ago, you sent me eyeball emojis, and that was supposed to mean Pratt was playing. And I'm like, how did you, how did you deduce that? I, I, the emoji game is very much to draw up some some attention, but certainly Keon Coleman's focus is is football. It's all football. It's all getting to the league and making as much money as possible. So when you target him a couple times a game, that's that's not sufficient. I will say this: if you watched last week's game, very vanilla. And there are a few instances where you can say, hey, there wasn't really a game plan here. We're not going to put much on tape. We're going to go through the motions a little bit. Remember, this is supposed to be a hurricane game last week. A lot of running. There wasn't going to be a ton of downfield shots. That was in the game plan. Now, when the weather didn't arrive, you would have thought, you know, maybe switch it up a little bit. But that was a really weird game from that perspective. Overall, though, I think your point is very accurate. Florida State's offense hasn't put together a complete game yet. You know, you had a stretch early against LSU where you gained 32 yards on four drives. The starters were not crisp against Southern Miss, just a 38% success rate in the first half. Held scoreless the final 16 minutes at Boston College, and, and the season was on the line. 
we've also gotten a glimpse of what the peak looks like and it's you know six straight scoring drives to end the LSU game offensive depth on full display against Southern Miss I think that was the first time FSU hung 60 points since the 2013 national championship team and even though it wasn't Chris from the starters against Boston College FSU scored 31 points their first 15 minutes of possessing the ball despite you know the vast majority of the team and I don't think this is being talked about it's not an excuse the vast majority of Florida State was dealing with the flu last week if you watch them warm up a lot of guys had masks on felt like at 31 10 ball at midfield late third quarter FSU starts thinking about Clemson a little bit but there's there's some legitimate concerns here I think you're still looking for an identity of what this offense wants to be we know Mike Norvell wants to run the ball but you can easily sit Jordan Travis back there uh, and, and shotgun and go four or five wide and maybe that becomes what we could ultimately see I think we made a point also about Florida State's offensive line heading into the season and all the experience in the top eight guys in the rotation combined for over 14,000 snaps but I think the one thing I cautioned was sure that the floor is higher what's the ceiling there isn't a surefire early round draft pick in the top eight guys along the offensive line. And I think one thing we did fail to mention altogether was was cohesion, right? There are times where Bless Harris, Casey Roddick, Washington, Jones, and Byers are your starting five left to right. Those five had never taken a snap together prior to this season at those positions. And I think it's why FSU is having trouble getting push in the ground game to the level people expect. Last year it was 5.7 a carry. This year it's 5.4. Um, 37% of non-garbage time runs, basically, if you look at, um, was the rushing success against Southern Miss. Just 1.8 line yards created against Boston College. Now their front is a little bit better than people think it is there's two guys along that d-line that had some serious nil interest from bigger programs in boston college was kind of able to to wade that off a little bit um that's not going to cut it against clemson's defensive front in a hostile environment i think you need to see a little bit more of marquise and douglas at the tight end and heavy formations to help the ground game you need better from trey benson in the backs i mean benson hasn't handled lead back you know lead running back duties very well he put on about seven pounds this offseason doesn't look like it's helped in the explosiveness still kind of pitter patties you know pitter batters too much um i think we need to see a little bit more of rodney hill collectively though you know florida state's running backs outside the top 90 in missed tackle percentage force i think they missed Treshawn ward that was something brad and i talked a little bit about off air you know this this offseason I think Florida State's going to need Jordan Travis's legs to be a, a factor. You mentioned at the top dealing with a a non-throwing shoulder issue. To my understanding, not as much of an issue as as people were led to believe. You also think about how this game lays out. High leverage game, probably a little more Jordan Travis running. Need to shoot it up a little bit. No biggie. By a week next week, Virginia Tech after that probably could win the Virginia Tech game by 10 if you throw Tate Rodemaker out there. So I think it's it's all systems. That might go. be the nicest thing you've um, ever said about Tate Rodemaker on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so you also saw him running late against Boston College. There was a short yarded situation. I believe it was third and six. Kind of puts his shoulder down and dips out of bounds, gained two yards, and it was going to set up that fourth and four to go for it at midfield. And then they ultimately, I think, had a penalty and they had to punt. But I think, you know, the biggest thing for Jordan Traps needs to reel it back in trying to win the damn Heisman on every throw. There's lots of guys open underneath that Travis is bypassing, reads over the middle that are wide open, slot receivers that just are not getting the ball thrown to him. He's trying to make the picture-perfect throw outside to Keon or Johnny. No reason you know, to make it as difficult as Jordan Travis has. If you look at his throw chart, he's not really threatening the middle of the field, and I think that needs to change a little bit here. I, there's plenty of X's and O's in matchup shit that we can uncover at, at any time, and I think our loyal listeners know that by now. But my suspicion is this is very much about the Jimmys and Joes, and you're going to know pretty early. Did FSU get their wake-up call last week like the 2013 National Championship team did in Chestnut Hill? Is Florida State better acclimated to the road noon kickoff environment because that's what they dealt with last week? Has the flu completely passed through the team and everyone's 100% good to go? My suspicion is yes. And are you going to get the FSU offensive line that bullied LSU in the second half? Are you going to get a decisive, confident Jordan Travis taking what the defense gives him? Because there's something I I sent Brad a note this offseason. I said, hey, 
you know, they're already preparing for week one. They're already preparing for week four. I think there's some stuff that uh, has not been presented to this point in the season that's going to come out for Clemson. I also look at Clemson's defense, and I think they're damn good. There's some areas that don't depict dominance, and I feel like that's the perception of Clemson's defense right now, like back to being dominant. But there's a reason both starting defensive ends had to come back for a year six. Against Duke, you look Riley Leonard, Jordan Waters, and Jacquez Moore averaged 3.3 yards per rush before first contact. The Clemson front seven did not generate a single havoc play against Duke. The competition faced the last two weeks, highly questionable. Charleston Southern's offense scored zero points the first 29 minutes against the North Greenville Crusaders, okay? 13 points all game. Charleston (laughs) scored zero offensive points against William & Mary. FAU's offense managed to score 10 points at home against Ohio. This is really? yeah. They scored a defensive touchdown. Yes, yes. I, this is truly the first real offense Clemson's played, and um, I think we're going to see this. I think we're going to see a decent Florida State offense here. Now, yesterday's practice wasn't as crisp as I would have would have liked um, from the practice reports. Jordan Travis did look good though, so uh, I I came away. And, and I'll just be candid. I know we got to get to Brad's side of the ball. Last week, Thursday morning, probably 6 a.m., I shot Brad and I said, hey, you know, there's only a couple spots that have the look headline. Go ahead, grab Clemson plus three and a half. I didn't ex- expect it to come three and a half this week. And that just allows you to do whatever you want with this game. I initially came into this thinking, boy, I want to be all over Clemson. My vibe changed a little bit in the last like 36 hours. It's an interesting dynamic because you highlight some of the concerns for Clemson defensively, and they didn't get off the edge at all against Riley Leonard. He was able to break contain. We saw the long run that was kind of backbreaking of sorts. And while the Clemson offense obviously drew the ire, not having to punt the entire time in the second half, it was the defense that couldn't come up with a timely stop or get that pivotal three and out to really change some of that momentum. And Brad, when we look at this Clemson team offensively, look, they average a shade less than 500 yards per game, which is 20th in the country. They're a run first team essentially what they've shown so far with 215 plus rushing yards per game they've shown some capabilities throwing but the caliber of competition that I think both of you guys have gotten into obviously bears some concerns and when you look at Cade Klubnik I still have major reservations about the kind of weapons that he has on the outside when you look at Bo Collins and Antonio Williams two guys that don't remind us of any of the elite Clemson receivers we've seen in the past in the backfield it's all about Will Shipley and his backup Um, Uh, Phil Maffa. At the same time, Florida State defensively showed a little bit of vulnerability against LSU's passing attack in week one. We don't even really have to place a lot of emphasis on the mobility that they struggled with last week against BC. But when you look for a critical matchup here for Clemson playing at home with a young quarterback, is it Cade's legs or arm that Florida State really has to contend with? Obviously, I also think he's got to limit uh, mistakes, but I, I think you said it well there, breaking down Clemson's offense. You know, I watched the replay of the FAU game, and, you know, you see the point total, and you're like, oh, okay, they're starting to make some progress here after putting up 60-plus against the FCS team, Charleston Southern, the week prior. And I, I'm expecting to see the offense turn the corner. And I got to be honest, watching that, not what I saw. bunch of the short fields, uh, pick six uh, to start off the game by the defense. That pretty much led to the 48 points scored in that game. And you mentioned Klubnik. I, I, you know, I'm not ready to call him a disappointment yet. He's still a sophomore, but I, I'm almost pretty confident that I can safely say he's not going to be Deshaun Watson or Trevor Lawrence. Just not going to be that guy. Uh, but I, I, there's not nothing in the at the end of last season or the start of this season, and maybe the light bulb turns on. But I, I just question it. I mean, number 85 in QBR. Uh, yeah, the counting stats and the touchdown interception ratio are fine, but. Uh, you know, he doesn't have a lot of weapons around him in the past game. You mentioned Antonio Williams and Bo Collins. We've also had a couple of, you know, I don't think significant injuries, but guys down the line that, you know, you lose a couple of your depth guys uh, that, that, that could hurt you, impact you down the road. Uh, I just don't see an elite wide receiver on the roster, period. But there isn't any of those go-to guys that they had in 2016 and 18 when they're winning titles. Uh you know, and in fact, last week you flip on the tape, and who are they relying on in the red zone? It's a true freshman, Tyler Brown. 
I mean, who's one of the lowest rated recruits uh, in this year's class? And he's leading the way. Nothing against him. It's just, my goodness. I mean, if a low level three star kid is already making an impact, I mean, that, that tells you where this uh, wide receiver room is. And it's not great. Now, obviously, I, the bright spots on the offense for me, you mentioned it, Chipley and Maffa. Uh, you know, they've been productive. They give you two different looks. Shipley a little bit more explosive. Maffa is the bigger back. Uh, the, the offensive line, you know, the, the pain, I got to give Payne credit. He's got me looking at different stuff, the, the analytics. And I'm, uh, uh, you know, I don't quite understand every single one of them, but uh, I know there's charts and what I know is green is good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, yeah, the stuff rate and the line yards per rush are good. But then you look at, you know, another metric, you know, the, that, that uh, you know, PFF grades the offensive line number 864 in run blocking. And that's, you know, I, I, I don't see the push yet on that offensive line that you'd like to see against subpar competition. I'll just put it – I don't see guys getting blown off the ball. Uh, and, and I think the most concerning thing about Clemson's offense, and this even goes back to the Tennessee bowl game, the red zone, number 115 in red zone offense. you got a kicker that's not very confident right now. It's missed three field goals. He missed an extra point last week. In a very close game, I, I mean, I, we don't t- break down special teams too often here, but my goodness, I don't have a lot of confidence if my kicker's going out there trying to kick a field goal to win a game or keep it close here. With that being said, moving to the defensive side of the ball for Florida State, I don't say these too often unless I, I really start watching a team game after game after game. I, I feel like I got a good grasp of it. I am not a fan of Florida State's defensive coordinator, Adam Fuller. Just not. I mean, Payne can love him. I don't think he does, though. Uh, I just I, – I, there's just too many breakdowns for me. Uh, I'm really worried about the back end. Uh, you know, you, you look – obviously LSU was throwing when they got down late. But there's just consistently breakdowns. And last week, I know you're dealing with a mobile quarterback, and maybe he gave you some looks that you just weren't anticipating. Uh, but then there was also instances where he's sitting back there, and he's got all, the, all day to throw the football at Castellanos. Uh, it's just they got to get off the field. There was multiple breakdowns on third and long last week that extended Boston College drives that if they get off the field. I don't, I'm not sure that Boston College has that big come from behind, almost upset win there. Uh, now, looking at it on the back end, it's kind of boom or bust. They've been good, you know, 50.5% completion rate allowed. I mean, that's top 10 in the country. Uh, they've only given up two passing touchdowns so far this year. That's great. Uh, but 7.7 yards per pass attempt, below average. Uh, you know, you look at the havoc rates there, but again, allowing too many explosives. Uh, the tackling hasn't been crisp, in my opinion, at times. Uh, you know, and there's, they have a lot of depth on defense. Uh, and obviously, Jared versus, a, you know, an All-American type. Although I'm not sure that he's played like a first-team All-American like we expected so far this season. Mm-mm. Jerry and Joan, yeah, I – Jerry and Jones has been fine. I think he's been good at cornerback. Safety's a, a worry for me. I mean, and it was kind of exposed with Dan out last week. I thought that safety position, that was already a concern coming into the season. Uh, it's just they got a lot of good players. I haven't seen a lot of elite performances out of the defense, and I don't think they have an elite defensive corner. Now, I, as I texted Payne, I'm not sure Clemson's the team that, that fully exposes the defense. Uh from what I've seen so far uh, in ACC play, it might have to come down the line against a Miami or a North Carolina where they, they truly get tested. So uh, I'm intrigued. It's a very intriguing matchup because I would argue the two teams' strengths go up against one another, the Florida State offense against Clemson defense, <laughs> and the two teams' weaker units, the Clemson offense and the Florida State defense, they get matched up with one another. So I just, I honestly think it comes down to what unit here. Uh, makes the least amount of mistakes, whether it's Florida State's, you know, lack of breakdowns or they, you know, they have some breakdowns on, on the back end. And, and we'll see if Klubnik can play a really clean game. I think I think that's a storyline here in this matchup. It's always interesting to see how these teams rebound and what kind of self-scouting they've done. Obviously, when you look at the two teams, the best data point we have Florida State playing LSU in terms of them putting together uh, the better part of, you know, two and a half solid quarters and getting that win and Clemson struggling mightily throughout that second half against Duke. Brad, you brought up the kicker for Clemson, and that was one of the more interesting stories digging into this game that Robert Gunn, 14 of 15 on extra points, has struggled with field goals. So what does Clemson do? They re-recruit their backup kicker who is taking online classes away from campus who's in the NBA program to try and bring him in, hoping that Jonathan Whites can be that kicker 
kicker to stabilize some of their special teams going forward. A guy who never got a lot of run behind one of the potential All-Americans that they had in that mix previously. Last word to you on this game, though, Brad. When you look at these two teams and how you graded them coming into the season, how much adjusting have you done through the first couple of games that we've seen each team? Yeah, Florida State up two and a half points uh, and Clemson down two and a half points. So this is a game where, you know, I didn't bet it in the summer, but there was showing some slight value to Clemson. I had him a little bit more than a field goal favorite in the summer. Now I got the game close to pick him and kind of similar to to Payne's point on the game. I did bet the look ahead, the plus three and a half. I agreed with him. I just didn't think we were going to see that hook during game week uh, and did take advantage of that before and tried to take advantage of it when I saw Jordan Travis down uh, in the first half to see if uh, some book was still (laughs) stupid uh, to have that line still up. They weren't. So credit to the book for for not having that up. Where do we think this goes? A great question. Uh, We've seen a little bit of Florida State money. There was a little bit of Clemson, and then we've seen a little bit of buyback on Florida State. I don't think it gets to three, to be honest with you. Uh, if it did, I think there'd be a little pushback there. But uh, I, I agree with your sentiments. I, I was thinking, all right, I, I'm going to like Clemson in, in this game as a home underdog, but I'm not there. Uh, I think it's a pretty fair number, to be honest. Yeah, with I think you may s- that was, that was- see a couple of recreational books try and flicker a three, but to – Brad's point, I have to imagine that as soon as they get out there, any of the value seekers will look to gobble up the home underdog in this spot. I would say, you know, Florida State really legitimately almost losing that game outright kind of prevented probably the love that we might have seen on a. I think there's a little bit of hesitation on uh, Florida State a little bit right now. It's always interesting, guys, for a game of this magnitude. Clearly, Florida State, by virtue of that week one victory, has bought themselves a little bit of wiggle room as far as the national landscape is concerned. Clemson, obviously, under the microscope, not just from a national championship aspiration, but obviously in the confines of the ACC, should they be able to bounce back knowing they've been saddled with a loss against a league foe in the Duke Blue Devils. Out west, we'll head to Salt Lake City, where a pair of unbeatens will do battle at Rice Eccles Stadium. It's UCLA at 3-0, the Utah Utes with the same record. Very different in terms of what they've been able to accomplish resume-wise, and that's part of the reason that you see Utah a 4 four and a half point favorite total on this game at 51 throughout most of the market. It'll be homecoming in Salt Lake City. They're going to stripe the stadium, so it should provide quite the visual spectacle with red and white. When you look at UCLA, this is a program that's 1-7 away from home against ranked teams since their last win in Salt Lake City eight years ago. The only win during that span was one of the more wild college football games. Some of the diehards will remember a 67-63 win up in the Palouse where they had to erase a massive deficit. When you look at Utah so far this year, the biggest question mark, gentlemen, has been about injury. Kyle Whittingham talking how few players they had out of what he calls their core 36 available for an FCS in-state rival in Weber State last week. But it's more about the starting quarterback and will he or won't he be out there for Utah when they take the field this week against UCLA. We'll get to that side of the ball in a moment. But Brad, we'll start with you because UCLA has an elite quarterback in their own right that's really caught the college football world by storm. Chip Kelly may not have officially announced his starting quarterback yet, but everybody wearing baby blue and gold knows who gives them the best ceiling and that's Dante Moore who attempted just 12 passes last week against North Carolina Central to throw for 182 yards and a pair of scores you look at his numbers so far he's thrown a great deep ball but you break down some of his spray charts and this is a guy who relies heavily on throwing to the right side of the field they've kind of shied away from letting the young quarterback throw between the hashes in steps a Utah defense that we know has been stout historically but hasn't exactly lived up to some of their high standards coming in but for a game of this magnitude, a young quarterback against the veteran defense, how do you see this unfolding? Yeah, so Dante Moore, uh, a unique recruitment for this true freshman. Uh, originally thought to go to Notre Dame. He's a five-star kid out of Michigan. Michigan typically doesn't have a lot of five-star quarterbacks out of the state. And it's funny, they're going to have three straight, it looks like, in consecutive years. But uh, So I was familiar with him uh, quite a bit. And then, you know, he goes to Oregon, and then Kenny Dillingham gets the Arizona State job, and then somehow, some way, in a shock to many, he ends up at UCLA. So very unique situation here. Uh, I, I mean, I bet you could have gotten 200 to one uh, at some point in his recruitment that that's where he'd finish up at. So, uh, what kind of quarterback is he? Uh, very accurate. Uh, you know, looks calm and collected. The moment so far hasn't looked too big for him, although. 
this week. It might <laughs> uh, for a true freshman. I mean, I, I'm not sure a road uh, a road venue at San Diego State is, is you know the the best uh, data point as far as h- how he's going to handle a big time road crowd. I watched that game, <laughs> and the UCLA is not known to to bring a lot of fans, but it was kind of a 50 50 situation there. Uh, what do I see? I'm glad you brought up because I, I didn't even. I noticed it now that you brought it up, but yeah, they do throw to the right con- considerably for him. He's not going to a, a lot of reads. Guys are running open consistently, and, and kudos for for Chip. I know a lot of people have said that he's lost his fastball and the game has caught up to him. I got to tell you on tape, I mean, he's still pretty dynamic when it comes to play calling. I mean, they had a long touchdown run against San Diego State out of the T formation. Uh, I, I loved, I, I've loved what I've seen so far, although competition has been questionable, to say the least. One of the guys besides Dante Moore uh, that, that I've really liked uh, is the, the Ball State transfer. And they said they scouted him from watching midweek Maction football. So uh, everyone loves Maction football, it looks like, but uh, to the detriment of Mac, uh, with the transfer portal, to the detriment probably of those programs, isolated TV games during midweek, people are scouting your roster. So Carson Steele's looked apart. I mean, 8.1 yards per carry. They got another kid, TJ Harden, has been running in the open, 9.3 yards per carry for him. Uh, the stuff rate's good. Line yards per rush are good. Good success rates on standard downs, passing downs. Everything is good so far. But again, the, the, the opposition has been questionable. Another transfer that looks good for him, J. Michael Sturdivant uh, from Cal. He just pops on tape. I mean, he's got explosiveness, at least so far, averaging t- more than 24 yards per catch. Uh, PFF has him one of the highest graded players. Uh, so a lot of good. I mean, in fact, Dante Moore, even with 12 passing attempts, was the highest graded player in the Pac-12 on offense per PFF last week. Where are there some possible weaknesses besides Dante Moore and how he'll handle a road atmosphere? Yeah, the pass block grade's not great, according to PFF. Uh, I haven't seen you know a, a team really test that offensive line to see if the, the, there could be some possible issues. I'm here to tell you, they'll get tested. Uh, no matter who's out there on that Utah front, we even saw it against Florida. They're down several starters up front, and a guy like Jonah Ellis has a big game with a couple of sacks. Uh, Fano has got a couple of sacks on the year. This is one of the deepest and most talented defenses that Kyle Whittingham's had. And I, I thought they dominated Florida's offensive line uh, in that first game. It, well, when Florida decided to run the football, you know, they got down and Florida kind of abandoned it. So it was a little bit of a surprise there. But, you know, field position, they just do what Utah normally does, the little things. You know, they've dominated field position so far. They've gotten good push. Uh I just, you know, at every level, I think they have good, solid, you know, first or second team all Pac-12 type players. Lander Barton, highly regarded kid coming out of high school, one of their highest rated recruits. He was the highest graded player in the Pac-12 on defense last week. Cole Bishop has stood out to me um, really in the Baylor game. I thought he had a good one there. If there's one weakness that I've seen a little bit, I expected a little bit better play out of the interior defensive line. They haven't had too many standouts there. And they also, you know, I, I'm talking about UCLA, questioning their quality of competition. I, I know Utah's played a pretty good FCS team in Weber State, and obviously Florida and Baylor, two Power Five teams. But I'm not sure that they faced a team that's capable of, of consistent explosives like Chip can dial up for UCLA. So uh, Florida was out of sorts from the, the the start of that game. Baylor had a backup quarterback. Uh, and even Weber State, if you're familiar with them, they rely more on their defense and offense. So I, I'm questioning – you know what? What this? How good this Utah defense really is? The good thing is we'll find out. And uh, I think the more intriguing handicap is on Payne's side of the ball because I think if you got a feel for what's going to happen with the quarterback situation, you might be uh, getting in front of a, a significant line move. Yeah, it's always interesting, Brad, when you look at a young quarterback, even one that has a ceiling as high as Dante Moore. What Chip Kelly will elect to do in hostile territory? Because I think what you said is perfectly. Uh, accurate in terms of, yes, he's played in a true road environment, but Snapdragon Stadium on a Saturday, even in prime time, nowhere close to what he's going to encounter in homecoming at Salt Lake City. And I think a lot of the casual college football fans, not those that listen to this podcast all the time, don't appreciate how difficult a building that can be to play in. It's not 100,000 strong in Salt Lake City, but they will come ready. They will come loud. And it's why Utah has been able to capitalize on that. But 
Payne, Brad mentioned the other side of the ball, and speculation continues around who the starting quarterback will be for Utah when they go out there on offense for their first series against UCLA. And it was Kyle Whittingham with a comment earlier this week that was pretty interesting. He said, we're at the direction of the medical staff. The surgeon is the one that ultimate." guy that says thumbs up or thumbs down for playing. We've heard for weeks that Cam Rising has been cleared for full contact in practice. You can understand why they didn't run him out there in non-conference games or against Weber State, but while the market suggests that he is going to be out there in a full capacity this week, we haven't seen Utah officially say Cam is our guy. He will be the starter. There will be no limitations on anything he's able to do. And until we know that, it makes the life a little bit more difficult knowing that Nate Johnson was the starting quarterback and took all the reps offensively against Weber compared to Bryson Barnes, who took the lion's share of the first couple of games. I think there's lots of variance on this side of the matchup because of that and you know, our understanding, this was the exact game, the Utes, Cam Rising and Rising Surgeon, um, Dr. Neil Atrash, targeted for his return the entire offseason, right? The start of Pac-12 conference play. And you mentioned Cam Rising being a full participant last week at practice without limitations. But I am would have thought Whittingham wouldn't divulge who the quarterback would be and make UCLA prepare for both rising and a completely different style quarterback in Nate Johnson. But the word is there's going to be announcement tomorrow on Thursday. And, you know, there's been some hints and some insinuations and some articles and some information surfacing that, you know, maybe rising and Kuthi could have a different focus that might not necessarily be on Utah this season. We'll see. Just we know at this point, you know, Dr. Neil Trash hasn't cleared either to play uh, game action yet. And, you know, he's, to your point, the end-all be-all in this situation, we're told. Now, without, you know, rising in Kuthi, Utah's offense hasn't been good. Um, the data point against Austin Armstrong certainly looks a little bit better, right? And then going on the road against the Dave Aranda defense is, isn't easy, but that's not an elite unit right now. And you're just looking up front, that O-line isn't getting much push. And that was a unit that Kyle Whittingham was talking about, how much he loved this offseason, how they go 10 deep. But Utah ball carriers right now averaging just 1.7 yards before contact. There's been zero explosiveness to the Utes ground game. Four runs of 15 plus yards on design runs and known passing situations. And I think that's where they're missing Cam Rising, you know, in a big way. The combination of of Johnson and Barnes at quarterback has led to a 29% success rate in those known passing situations. There's just not a lot of weapons on Utah's offense that are, you know, going to keep defensive coordinators up at night without Kuthi and rising. And we know that they made a play for Micah Pittman in the portal. He's never really been that guy. He's a nice player, but, you know, coming back from, from, you know, a hip injury, got re-injured, you know, a couple games ago. And I just, I don't see weapons there. I do think the second layer of variance here is, is UCLA's defense, right? They made the coordinator change this off season. They go to DeAnton Lynn, who comes over from the Baltimore Ravens. And if you read those quotes all off season from players, the defenders were completely buying in to what Lynn was selling, right? The younger voice, the vibe was like players connected better, you know, with a younger former player than the last two defensive coordinators that, that Chip Kelly hired. And I understand there's some public schedule adjust efficiency creators out there that have UCLA's defense 35th in the country heading into this week and it wouldn't stun me if UCLA shows well in this spot because of what Utah's offense has right now especially if Cam Rising and Kuthi don't go but for me like UCLA at 35 is a bit high I don't think you can go from 94th in our schedule adjusted metrics to 35th in, in one off season and our preseason projection was in the 60th range for the Bruins and I don't think UCLA has really been tested to start the season, right? I mean, North Carolina Central, a San Diego State offense that will finish outside the top 100, yeah. right? Like, Coastal Carolina's offense has some cachet, but they lost a lot from last season, including, you know, the mastermind behind the entire operation. And you look, the first couple quarters against Coastal Carolina – UCLA's defense led more than 50% of snaps to grade successful against a, a schedule outside the top 100 so far this season. You know, you'd, you'd like to see better stuff rate, fewer explosive passes allowed. So, you know, QB, blocking, 
right? The weapons questions for Utah, the strength of schedule questions um, for UCLA's defense, not really fully allowing us to peg how improved that unit is. Brad said it perfectly, like Utah's defense, we just kind of expect them to play to a baseline and have this very high floor, but they haven't been tested yet. So for me, um, there's a lot of variance in this game. It's why the totals sat right there around 50 and a half, 51, obviously a key number. I think this all comes down to the injury report. I don't really want to say too much, but it, to me, <laughs> this game's going to be decided on the injury report and who plays and who doesn't. And that's really the the summation of this game. There's a lot of matchups that are interesting that are fun to talk about, but all of it uh, is secondary relative to to Cam Rising and Cooper. Well, I'll open. I'll fire back at the last point that neither of you guys can take this then. And while we wait for the official status and determination of Cam Rising and we look at the number with Utah, a four, four and a half point favorite, if Rising is upgraded, does this number go up? Do you guys believe that Rising's status as being 75 to 80% likely to be the starting quarterback is baked into the number? I'm not worried about the total, uh, but in terms of the side, curious to get your perspective. Oh, I think it goes up uh, a couple of points. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I uh, could even touch seven, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, you look at the – like, it's an illiquid market, but, uh, you know, the, 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 there was a few books that had this game out in, in the game of the year markets, and it was uh, above a touchdown, I'll put it that way. Hey, it's a fair assessment, and obviously we try and figure out the valuations of players who is going to be 100%, what they'll look like in their first game back, and more important, their overall availability should make for interesting viewing Saturday afternoon from Salt Lake City for two teams that obviously have aspirations of competing for a Pac-12 title. Speaking of the Pac-12, gentlemen, uh, all eyes will be on Autzen Stadium at the same time where... the Oregon Ducks will welcome in the Colorado Buffaloes as three touchdown favorites in this contest. Total in the game, 70 and a half. Never anticipated coming into the year, guys, that we'd be talking about Colorado nearly every single week on this fine show, but here we are. And lo and behold, the college football schedulers have decided next week when Colorado hosts USC, that game will kick off at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time uh, as Fox doing some finagling with their schedule, knowing the kind of draw that Dion has created. And and when you look at the Buffs, they've lost 31 straight games against top 15 opponents, dating back to a 2007 home win over Oklahoma. They're 2-30 and 30 away from Boulder against top 15 opponents this century, including 27 straight losses. When we look at Colorado's game effort last week against Colorado State, they scored on just one of its first 10 offensive drives before they roared to life down the stretch, putting points on the board in five out of their last six series. Guys... I think it's all about the market. When we look at Colorado right now, we can talk about the X's and O's until we're blue in the face. But when we look at some of the pricing that's gone on, the first question, Brad, I'll come to you on. Travis Hunter not being available for the next two to three weeks. It's rare that we talk about a skill position player impacting a number, but Travis Hunter is unlike any other player. When you talk about him being a cluster injury all by himself, given the snap (laughs) distribution we've seen, 149 on offense, 180 on defense, 10 on special teams, 339 in total, which is the most in FBS through week three. Yeah, so I'm pretty conservative. Uh, I would say if you're not at least downgrading Colorado's team power rating a point, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. I mean, I could be talked into even more than that, which is considerable. I mean, for a non-quarterback to to move a needle uh, like that. But, you know, he's obviously very talented. He's outperformed expectations so far. Uh, And it's not only him playing both ways. Uh, at a pretty good level, but it's also Colorado has depth issues, and that was always a concern with this team. You uh, you saw the, the the starting 22, you were like, wow, the, the starting 22 is pretty capable. They're much improved, but if they had any attrition, th- that's when you know Colorado 2022 might start showing. Uh, so, yeah, I think – I mean, I downgraded them a point for that, but also obviously downgraded them significantly off the Colorado State uh, performance. Payne, as far as the market and the way that they've handled Colorado, clearly odds makers have been scrambling every single week when you look at where Colorado has closed versus what the final scores have indicated. They go into week one against TCU as a 21-point underdog. They win that game by three, so you're talking about a 24-point differential there. They close minus two and a half against Nebraska, win that game by 22, so nearly a three-touchdown differential final score uh, to 
where the betting market closed. And then last week, theoretically, odds makers are the closest they've been because Colorado wins by eight. They close as a 23-point favorite, but it would have been the widest margin had Colorado State been able to come up with a late stand on defense, and you'd have been talking about a 30-point variance. And we've seen it just week over week. When we broke down a game, potentially looking at Oregon in a spot, look-ahead numbers were 14, 14 and a half. Here we are now with the Ducks installed as a three-touchdown favorite. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to belabor this point, and I think we all understand that Colorado's record is better than expectation through three games. They certainly deserve to cover the number against TCU, whether they deserve to win that game, you know, two turnovers in the end zone inside the five, and then you win the the roll of the dice on the fourth down variance game-winning touchdown. You struggle mightily early against Nebraska had they had any competent play at quarterback that game's probably a little different because Nebraska is going to quiet that crowd because it probably should have been 10 nothing Nebraska to start that game and then last week obviously Colorado State pissed down their leg and, and blew a double digit lead late in that game so I think you know we understand Colorado has has exceeded expectations I think we all understand there's four to five guys on this Buffalo's roster that are impact players. So we've upgraded Colorado to a point that makes us uncomfortable, even with the downgrade last week, you know, but, but there were look headlines under two touchdowns for this Oregon game last week. There were reopens <laughs> this week below 17. All prices substantially lower than what TCU laid week one against Colorado and, and Oregon would be about a two touchdown favorite hosting TCU right now. So again, like, I don't think the the look ahead or the reopen price made a ton of sense. We're a little higher on Travis Hunter's worth. We actually made it two points to the spread, wow. right? One and a quarter on defense because he has been a shut down corner, three fourths of a point on offense. That's probably, you know, maybe too aggressive. But when you put the number in context, right, like Colorado right now is surviving because it has an NFL quarterback, likely the third quarterback taken if Sanders comes out in the 2024 draft. You have Weaver, Edwards, Horn and Woods. They're nice players. Colorado doesn't have many right now that are very good. So I think you always have to have a little bit of art in some of your player projections because to me, Travis Hunter's worth far more to Colorado than if he played at Georgia, right? That just basic math. I don't know. I've, I don't and... know. I've watched that Georgia offense so far this season. Travis Hunter might be the most <laughs> dynamic playmaker they could have down there in Athens. Oh, I, I, I think he is, but the drop off. Yeah. No, right? for like sure. Who's the next guy, right? Yeah. Dion, you know, something we said. You know, I kind of threw in a little jab there, and it really wasn't. It was just a piece of information, right? Everyone sees Cormani McLean, five-star cornerback, and, you know, Dion gets asked the questions, like, well, where's Cormani? Is he going to – he was always as raw as raw gets. He's going to take some time. He's not going to be a guy you slip in there. And you think about who's starting opposite of Travis Hunter in defense. It's Marion Cooper. Couldn't get on the field at Florida State this year. That's why he transferred out. So that's your lead corner now. And in a game where you have Bo Nix in this very explosive <laughs> offense – Right, that's a little bit troubling. We already think the defense has some holes and some issues, and I'm going to be interested to see something, and I think it's going to be very telling for this game, and maybe I'm overthinking it. Think about all three weeks leading up. Dion's been, been quite loud, right? Everything's personal. <laughs> we heard Dan Lanning come out and basically take a jab at Colorado moving, moving to the Big 12 as if it were irrelevant. Let's see if there's a clip of Dion saying it's personal this week about that or if he's going to stay quiet. And I think it's pretty telling to the prospects of this yeah, game. Yeah, Dion hasn't said anything just yet about this and how much the game means to them and everything else. Sometimes uh, rubber meets the road eventually, yeah. and you wonder if the Buffalo becomes roadkill up there in the Pacific Northwest this weekend. Should Oregon want to go out there and make a statement? But an interesting game nonetheless. And obviously, hey, full marks to Dion Sanders in this Colorado program that has captivated the entire college football world. You look at some of the TV ratings they put forth last week against a Mountain West opponent. I mean, pretty staggering given that kickoff time at, after 10 o'clock Eastern. Now, the one thing I would suggest to the folks in Boulder, you may want to clear out the sidelines a little bit. The attendance there, it looked like there were more celebrities and Colorado football players, and they had about six inches of space every time they came to the sideline. But Colorado, clearly one of the biggest watches in college football and that most likely won't change this weekend when they get their first true test against the Oregon Ducks and in continuing along that same thought process 
The Pac-12 takes front and center, and I know a lot of our listeners, Payne, a little bit nervous about your sanity having to break down three Pac-12 games on one podcast, a league that we have been reluctant to discuss and give it its due praise in previous years. But clearly, this is a league now that has a lot more depth than it has had in a long, long time. And this game may fly under the radar, but may arguably be the most exciting from a pure football standpoint. Oregon State goes up to the Palouse to take on Washington State. It's the Oregon State Beavers, a field goal favorite. Total on the game up a touch from 56 to 57 and a half. When you look at the 108th meeting between these two programs, this will be the first time that they've ever played where both teams were ranked. The first since 2017 where either of these programs walked into this matchup ranked. You look at Oregon State, 14 straight road losses to ranked teams dating back to 2012, a win at then number 19 UCLA. And when you look at the last two trips to Pullman, Washington for the Beavers in 2019, it was Max Borgie scoring a touchdown with two seconds left for Washington State to win that game 54-53. And two years ago, it was Washington State prevailing 31-24 after the Beavers' potential game-tying drive stalled inside the Cougars' 10 with 33 seconds left. Last year, a little bit more defensive-minded as Cam Ward really struggled and Oregon State committed to the ground game in what amounted to Ben Goldbranson's second start at the helm for Jonathan Smith's offense. Payne, when we look at the Beavers' offense this year, we knew coming into the season it was all about the DJU redemption tour, but that Oregon State wasn't going to change its DNA. This was a run-first offense. Jonathan Smith had instilled that blue-collar work ethic in terms of the building blocks up front, and it was going to go where Damian Martinez and Deshaun Fenwick could take them. They looked to stub their toe a little bit against San Diego State. Jonathan Smith didn't mince words, saying they left some meat on the bone in that 26-9 victory. But here they are stepping up in class the first time they'll get tested on the other side of the ball that I know Brad will get to. But when we look at Oregon State offensively, where there are some things last week against San Diego State that concerns us with DJ, who showed struggles and some of the issues, especially in the turnover department, that plagued him while he was under center at Clemson. Yeah, I mean, DJ's not perfect. I think he's certainly an upgrade over what Oregon State had last year. He showed extremely well against San Jose State and UC Davis to be expected. But then, you know, you have some question marks when you struggle against the toughest defensive opponent to date. And that's really a downtrending San Diego State defense, not what it was years ago. Now, those struggles were primarily down to down and in the green and red zone areas because the Beavers offense still hit explosives to the point where they were, you know, averaging 7.7 yards a play on offense last week. So you kind of have to put it with 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 that caveat. This is the first true test though right hostile environment on the road in Pullman we know DJU is going to have to make some big plays through the air because it might not be as dominating of a ground effort here I think the area we thought Wazoo might be vulnerable defensively coming into the season was was right up the middle against the run hasn't been the case through three games you're looking at Wazoo they've allowed negative 0.07 EPA per rush to this point it's still Oregon State's MO on offense, right? You have a top 10 run blocking O-line that returns four or five starters, including two all-conference players. You have Damian Martinez and Fenwick in the backfield. It's a great one-two punch. Martinez averaging nearly nine yards a carry this year. With that type of personnel, Oregon State's going to try to play bully ball. They're going to they're not going to to, to change what they do. Um, and you look at Wazoo, they haven't faced an offensive line of this caliber yet. And I'm interested to see that test right sure we can think about wisconsin and say hey great offensive line but they're kind of transitioning to something completely different and i know they were able to stop the run game there but i think this one's a little bit different past the ground game though i think you have to take some shots downfield with dju's arm make some easy throws right those one-on-one throws where he doesn't have to necessarily read the defense wazoo has given up some explosive passes through three games the secondary was an area of concern coming into the season do get a couple bodies back in the secondary but I think you have to take some calculated shots to guys like Anthony Gold, who's averaging over three yards per route run this season. You have to be able to pass protect, right? And as, for as good as Oregon State's O-line is run blocking, they were outside the top 50 last season in pass protection. DJU's been pressured on 31% of his dropbacks this season. It's not like he's holding on to the ball for you know a super long period of time. But what is interesting to me is despite Wazoo returning two all-conference defensive ends in Stone and Jackson, Wazoo's only 
gotten pressure from the quarterback 26 percent of the time this season so that to me is kind of the game within the game is that's fine once you once you potentially stop Oregon State's ground game which I don't think is going to happen here right can you then get pressure on DJU and it, it just I don't know the the ends have not gotten to the quarterback at the rate we expected the other interesting part to this is and maybe we're going to steal something from Brad here and I know like the price here is wild to me right like right now we'd have Oregon State about a four and a half five point favorite on a neutral against Wisconsin they were laying two and a half in this spot where Wisconsin was laying four four and a half yeah. just like you know a handful of days ago so <laughs> i think the price is really interesting uh, on this game with with how uh <laughs> how odds makers are arrived at that number well you mentioned the price and we can go there brad because Payne talked about the wisconsin game and we know washington state took money against them in their season opener against colorado state market indicators not exactly indicative of how that game went with colorado state building a 39-3 lead at one point against wisconsin we saw the market open short but you did see some washington state money come in before the cougars won that game outright 31 to 22 against the badgers and here we are with washington state no doubt the more battle tested of these two teams while Oregon State has played two Mountain West foes an FCS opponent and they've looked good theoretically in doing so but we're not exactly sure what they are how have you adjusted these two teams on a couple of data points you have for each before we get into how Cam Ward and that Washington State offense should match up against the Beavers defensively yeah coming into the season I was pretty high on Oregon State so I mean it was an over win total even though it was pretty high for an Oregon State program I was pretty comfortable even going over eight because I I really liked what I saw meat and potatoes and obviously I think Jonathan Smith's one of the better coaches in the country so I've only upgraded them about a point just because I've been so far uh you know above market expectations where my numbers uh, have called to to, for me to bet Oregon State every single week so far Um, and it was good until (laughs) somehow it was a little uneven performance against against the Aztecs last week. Washington State, I've been more aggressive. Uh, wasn't necessarily high on this team coming in the season, but uh, I've upgraded them four and a half points. Uh, I don't know how you can't not like what you've seen. I mean, offensively in the Colorado State game, uh, super explosive. And then now you got a couple of data points to compare uh, to, to with that with. I mean, with Colorado State almost beating Colorado on the road. And, and look, I, the Wisconsin game, they certainly benefited from turnovers, but – Kudos for them for jumping on Wisconsin early in that game and really getting out in the front. So, yeah, and then last week they, they did what good teams do, annihilated an FCS opponent. So uh, I, I, I thought that was pretty solid for them to, to beat an FCS team by 40 points. Uh, so big upgrade for Washington State. But like Payne mentioned, a uh, little surprised that the bookmakers opened this one two, two and a half. I thought at minimum it should have been three. In fact, I'm more in the four range. Well, I mean, we look at the number, and the field goal is pretty much holding strong there. You t- referenced Washington State going out there and putting a hurting on Northern Colorado last week. They rolled up 700-plus yards in a dismantling there. We look at Cam Ward so far this season. He's been good protecting the football. And I think the biggest question that, that a lot of people had was how this Washington State offense could look after losing their offensive coordinator to North Texas. But when we broke down the Pac-12, there was a lot of optimism that there wasn't going to be nearly as much of a drop off, if any, given what some of the mainstream prognosticators thought was going to happen. Lincoln Victor has been a revelation, 24 catches, 342 yards. The problem for Washington State, Brad, has still obviously been their inability to run the football. I don't think they want Cam Ward to be their leading rusher in any capacity. And in steps an Oregon State defense that recorded six sacks on Saturday. And the Beavers have 12 sacks through their first three games after finishing 2022 with just a total of 20. Now, the sacks resulted in 50 yards lost in rushing the way college football calculates it. When you look at true rushing, San Diego State did have some success. They gained 120 yards on 28 carries for more than three yards a tote. But the biggest question I think all of us had about Oregon State defensively coming into the year was their secondary. You look at the first three opponents, none of those teams could test that defensive backfield. In steps Washington State in familiar surroundings how do we see things playing out with Oregon State's defensive front are they able to minimize some of the time Cam Ward can have in the pocket because he should have a decided edge throwing against what appears to me on paper to be the biggest weak link for Oregon State defensively yeah so I I think both teams have advantages that that they'll probably looking to expose it here obviously up front I think Oregon State has the advantage uh, when you look at their 
Uh, obviously, just basic counting stats as far as they've been pretty good uh, with rush yards per game allowed. I don't expect I would be stunned if Washington State could get to, to 100 yards rushing in this game. Uh, in fact, I even question their ability to get to 50. So I, I do not. <laughs> I do not. I expect a pretty one-dimensional Washington State offense, and I think Washington State's probably comfortable with that. But you have to show some semblance uh, of a run game, otherwise, Oregon State's going to tee off on Cam Ward. And Oregon State, you, you talked about the sacks; they've been consistent. Twelve sacks already this year. Sack rate's good. Uh, I, I thought they. You spoke about the secondary. I thought at corner they were a little lackadaisical last week against a San Diego State passing attack. That's. Oh my God, it's tough to watch. <laughs> and so, but the fact that the, you know San Diego State hit some explosives does raise some concerns because if there was, there's probably like five or six things I saw watching 61 spring games that really stood out to me, like the big picture stuff. Where I I went into it thinking one thing or, or not having a strong opinion, and then came out with a strong opinion. Washington State offensively was one of those opinions. I was like, wow, because I. Cam Ward was a disappointment last week. I think we talked him up. We thought he was going to be the next Bailey Zappi as far as production, an FCS quarterback jumping up and, you know, setting the world on fire. Didn't see it. Uh, he is now. I'm wondering if we were a year early, and I think a lot of it has to do with their new coordinator, uh, Ben Arbuckle, 27 years old. I didn't know much about him. How could you? <laughs> He's only 27. Uh, but, man, what I saw in that spring game was for a team with a brand-new coordinator – and three new wide receivers, all transfers, they were humming in a spring game better than most teams. And there wasn't any hesitation that the whole operation was going smoothly. And so far, we've seen that for the most part. Certainly, it surprised many, including myself in the market, what they did to Colorado State in week one. They did what they needed to do early on against Wisconsin to get out in front and kind of sat on that a little bit, although I thought Wisconsin dominated large portions of that second half and Washington State couldn't get anything going. So, yeah, I think they can expose the Oregon State cornerbacks. I will say this, for as bad as the Oregon State secondary is, man, they got two good-looking safeties. Uh, Maybe they're just good-looking as far as off the bus, but, I mean, that Oladapo kid, I mean, he's flashed to me for two years running. Uh, If you look, believe in pro football focuses ranks rankings both are in the top 50 so uh and they look like that on tape Akili Arnold and Oladapo so we'll see if that this the, the corners get exposed and Washington State can do that but I just question is Cam Ward going to have the time to do it and, and are they going to be too one-dimensional this week to have consistent success uh, on a possession in and possession out basis. One last thing I have for you, Brad, as it pertains to the total in this contest. When we look at Washington State, we go back to week one. They took under money against Colorado State. That total closed 54. They ended up with 74 total points on the board. The game was bet over against Wisconsin. That total closed 57 and a half, but it ended up 31-22, largely because Washington State didn't have to really push in the second half after they built an early lead. And then last week against Northern Colorado, hey, look, it's an FCS game. You're 47 seven and a half point favorite odds makers open the total or close it I should say at 54 and a half and northern Colorado allows 64 points in that contest do we feel odds makers have given this Washington State offense enough credit for what they can do given that all of these totals have essentially been within a two and a half to three point range thus far yeah I mean they weren't off I wanted to bet some overs with them uh I I was stunned uh, with uh, the early under money uh, in week one, I actually, it was one where I wasn't afraid to, to, to fade the steam there and ended up taking over. I uh, certainly took over when the Wisconsin game didn't come home there. Yeah, I'm not sure that they fully priced them in yet. Uh, and, and we've seen this one t- tick up a little bit. I mean, there was a 54 and a half out there. Unfortunately, somebody beat me to that. But I mean, generally speaking, I my first look would be a little bit more over than under in this one. All good. It's it's always interesting when you get these matchups for two teams that want to play very differently, but potentially each of them has strengths offensively that they can go against after the defensive teams or their defensive counterparts weaknesses so always curious to get your take on that you can follow brad on social media at brad power seven you can follow pain there as well at pain insider i'm todd Furman. you can follow me on x and most importantly as always follow the podcast at bet the board pod if you haven't already done so sign up for the bet the board podcast newsletter delivered right to your inbox every single friday throughout the course of the fall and this has become a broken record 
another rocking chair prop winner. Travis Kelsey, under 79 and a half yards was what you had last week. So a bonus way to build that bankroll in the prop market once those prices become more widely available. And all right, gents, from the Pac-12 and uncharted territory on the West Coast into more familiar surroundings in the SEC, where it's Ole Miss on the road against the Alabama Crimson Tide, and Alabama a full touchdown favorite in this game, total at 55.5. And And when you look at Alabama, Saturday will mark the 107th consecutive home game in which Alabama will open and close a favorite, starting with their 2007 loss to ULM. That game's also the last time Alabama lost consecutive home games. When you look at how Alabama has performed in this streak of 106 games of being favored, they've gone 99-7 and straight up. Obviously, if they did that ATS, that would be one hell of a record we'd be talking about in that regard. This week also marks Alabama's lowest ranking since 2015, where they were 13th in the AP poll. They ended up going on to win the national championship in 2015 behind Jake Coker. I'm not nearly as optimistic that this current cast of characters has a running back cut from the same cloth as Derrick Henry they can lean on to be able to make things happen. Obviously, a meeting of the minds here. Alabama's former defensive coordinator, Pete Golding, the one calling the shots defensively for Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin, didn't allow an opportunity to take some shots at Alabama's defensive coordinator Kevin Steele this week in his press conference. And Brad, when we look at Ole Miss coming into the year, Jackson Dart knew he was in a crowded quarterback room. wasn't quite sure how Ole Miss was going to handle all the things. Dart has distanced himself from Spencer Sanders and Walker Little. The team averages more than 52 points per game, fourth in the FBS, number one in the SEC. They ran the ball for 299 yards last game, albeit with an asterisk given the last 37-yard carry, which may or may not have sat real well with me as a Georgia Tech backer. (laughs) Uh, Jackson Dart, though, tied for the FBS lead, averaging 12.5 yards per attempt it puts him in rarefied air alongside Caleb Williams but for all the success that Ole Miss is having offensively one thing has really stood out and that's Quinshawn Judkins struggling to get things going whether he's the one that should be bearing the weight of responsibility on his shoulders or it's the offensive line when you look at Ole Miss and the way they want to attack Alabama does Lane Kiffin trust Jackson Dart to be the difference maker with his arm, or is this still all about Ole Miss and their ability to run the football against this Alabama defensive front? Well, I mean, I think you can use Jackson Dart both uh, in the pass and run game. I mean, they have so far, he leads the team in rushing. I don't know if that's ideal, and you can do that uh, throughout SEC play, but so far, I mean, he's been explosive, 6.7 yards per carry. Uh, and Quinchon Judkins hasn't been explosive so far. Now, some of that, he wasn't healthy last week, and there was questions on whether he was going to play or not in that game. One of the reasons why you have a Georgia Tech ticket in your pocket, if you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're anybody last week, it seemed like everybody did. Uh, somehow, some reason, they, Payne and I talked, those don't always come home. Uh, the, 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 those can be tough sometimes when every, everybody's one side there and, and everything lines up. Uh, but it, I think some of it depends on is Judkins fully healthy uh, th- this week. I seem to think that that'll be the case. He was kind of a surprise uh, a player uh, taking reps last week. So I, I would think that him being healthy, that they should lean on him a little bit more than what they have. They also, speaking of health, uh, I mean, Trey Harris and, and Priestcorn, uh, the wide receiver Trey Harris, uh, who has been dynamic the first couple of games of the season, 23 and a half yards per catch, five touchdowns. Priestcorn, uh, a transfer from Memphis that they really loved uh, during spring, and really, he was one of their, their top offensive performers. Uh, both of these guys practiced last I looked on Monday, so expected to be healthier. This is at least the healthiest they've been since the start of the season. Uh, I have, I'm have. i not a big Jackson Dart fan getting back to the quarterback, but he has certainly looked improved. I mean, he's number 11 in QBR. He's taken care of the football so far. Uh, you look at the completion percentage, touchdown and reception ratio way up. PFF has him number nine in the country. Again, he's getting explosives and leading the team in the run game. Uh, run blocking hasn't been great, so it's, it's kind of been him. Uh, his ability to make those plays have kind of over – overshadowed uh, what could get exposed here, that Ole Miss offensive line. Uh, The rush explosives are below average. But my goodness, though, when you look at this matchup and you have a multitude of wide receivers and Jordan Watkins and Harris and Dayton Wade, all three of those guys averaging over 19 yards per catch, and you go back to the Texas game for Alabama 
and you see, you know, Texas with a variety of wide receivers and tight ends and athletes in space, and Texas comes into that game with question marks as far as can they hit the deep ball, and they do consistently, I would like to think that that there's going to be some opportunities here for Ole Miss to have success against Alabama's defense uh, as far as explosives, big pass plays. And I'll tell you another thing. I think they can. Uh, Jackson Dart's going to have some explosives in, in the quarterback run game because I got to tell you, last week you pop on the tape. I know the counting stats are going to look good for Alabama's defense, only allowing three points against South Florida. But even though South Florida didn't have any pass attack, uh, semblance of a pass attack whatsoever, their quarterback – is run. I mean, he's got constant pressure, but but Byron Brown is running around and has nearly 100 yards rushing in the game despite getting sacked five times. So I I think Dark can pretty much pick your poison here and have their uh, have their way with this Alabama defense because I haven't been overly impressed, especially the interior of the defensive line. They got pushed around against Texas, in my opinion. Certainly, they they should have some players. I mean, two four seven has this as the most talented roster in college football history. I don't see it, but <laughs> Edge and Edge and linebacker have been good. And I thought Braswell and Dallas Turner finally started playing like the All-Americans they should be. Uh, last week they really flashed, but you should at South Florida for Pete's sake. Uh, the thing that worries me a little bit, Kool-Aid at cornerback has been a disappointment. I mean, you would expect him to be an elite ball player. Hasn't been the case. They're relying on a true freshman and Caleb Downs on the back end at safety. They had to get some transfers. Obviously, they knew they had some problems at safety. And post-spring, they had to get two transfers there. So a smart play caller like it's Steve Sarkeesian took advantage of that and really got after the true freshman Caleb Downs in that game. I would like to think that Lane Kiffin would do the same here. So uh, I – if you're asking me what what unit has the advantage, I think Ole Miss's offense has the advantage in this matchup. Payne, when we go to the other side of the ball, obviously Alabama's offense isn't lighting the world on fire either. And if Brad highlights some concerns he has for this team defensively, the betting market suggests that Alabama's offense may need to be better and more dynamic than what we saw in that 17-point outburst. And, of course, I use that term facetiously last week in, t- in Tampa against USF. And, and Nick Scarborough of ESPN had an interesting line in his article. And, you know, I can read it straight. He says, receivers aren't creating enough separation. The offensive line is allowing too much pressure in the backfield. Getting a snap from center has turned into an adventure rather than a formality. The running game is inconsistent at best. The players across the board are committing too many penalties. And and the offense as a whole doesn't appear to have a sense of identity or direction. If I'm reading that as a synopsis for the way a team is played, I think a lot of people go, okay, he's talking about Western Michigan or he's talking about Kent State. <laughs> Not exactly a reflection of what we've grown accustomed to from Alabama, but the Tide did come to their senses and go back to the most dynamic playmaker they have on the roster under center in Jalen Milrow. I know we all joked about Tommy Reese must not have watched Tyler Buckner in practice when they were both in South Bend together and expect him to suddenly have a revelation just because he changed the color of his jersey. But for Alabama offensively, do you see see a way that they can attack Ole Miss's defense that has a good defensive line, but you do have some question marks about how this team could perform on the back end. Yeah, I, I, you know, overarching Alabama fans might not realize this yet, but the best thing that could have happened to this season was watching both Tyler Buckner and Ty Simpson struggle against the USF defense. That is not very good, right? Because had either put up big numbers against a bad USF defense, it would have led to this false sense of security. And <laughs> I think it would have led to a real rude awakening this week against Ole Miss. Um, thankfully, Milrow's back in the saddle. And I don't think he's by any means a savior. But one thing we said probably multiple times in this podcast is, is Milrow has both the highest floor and the highest ceiling for, for Alabama this season. Now the question becomes, then can Tommy Reese devise the right game plan? And I know it's, it's not all on him. Um, but I think we were ahead of Alabama's O-line struggles coming into the season, and then when everyone was excited about the offensive outburst against MTSU, we were like, hey, let's pump the brakes here. We were sifting through the garbage, and we uncovered some some real areas of concern. If I'm Tommy Reese, I think a few things have to happen to get this offense at least respectable. Big men up front need to be challenged. I don't care about the age or the lack of experience. There is just far too much talent along Bama's O-line yeah. for some of these numbers to be transparent. 37% of runs stuffed through three games. Only 31% of rushing yards before first contact. Zero push. And this might be 
the worst pass protecting unit in the Nick Saban era. I mean, 118th in the country in sack rate allowed. When defenses send blitz against Alabama, they've turned it into a sack 32% of the time. There's just too much talent for this poor of a product and my understanding is maybe there was a challenge given because there was a players only meeting that transpired this week yep. let's see if if that unfolds into anything because you know there was some some disgruntled players um at the quarterback shift last week so i, I second thing i think that's really important here is like once you insert jalen Middlerow, his greatest ability is obviously the combination of the size the speed the athleticism The best way to help an offensive line is create that extra man advantage in the box by letting your quarterback run the ball. Milrose averaging 9.2 yards a carry on designed runs. The problem is Tommy Reese has only dialed it up five times in two games for Milrow. Final thing I think Tommy Reese has to do is just make the pass game for Jalen Milrow. ABC, one, two, three, paint by number. You cannot have Milrow in the shotgun think he's going to read a defense perfectly pre-snap go through all the progressions post-snap and deliver the ball on time and accurately to the intermediate parts of the field right Tommy Reese is doing everyone a disservice if that's what he's going to ask of Jalen Milrow this Bama pass game needs to be wide receiver and running back screens quick slants one read bootlegs with an option to take off if it's not there and if Ole Miss loads the box because they are now playing with this new four down front then Bama has to has to hunt the deep shot. We know Milrow has an arm cannon. We've seen the added touch and arch to the ball. Jalen Milrow right now, 147 rating on throws, 20-plus yards, seven big-time throws, not a single turnover-worthy throw on deep shots. And you have to allow him to take those. You just can't ask him to do all the difficult things. And I, I just think if you're going to ask Milrow to read the defense and go through progressions and make these intermediate throws – it's going to lead to some turnovers. That is not the sector where Milrow is very good. 30% turnover-worthy play rate throwing to that sector of the field. Can't do it. Scrap it in this game. And this is going to be a very difficult test for Bama's offense, right? Like, I, I fully understand not everyone is sold on the Rebels' defensive improvements. But, like, what's the grading scale here, right? Like, this Rebels defense was outside the top 100 last year in both schedule-adjusted success rate and EPA per pass allowed. Nobody should expect the 85 Bears, but I think it's an improved defense metrically and and by the eye test. And part of the reason this totals crashed down from a peak of 57 to, to 54 and a half is because what you hinted at at the top, Todd, the familiarity. Ole Miss's defensive coordinator, Pete Golding, spent his prior five seasons at Alabama. And remember something we said earlier this season about Tommy Reese taking over the Alabama OC job. Alabama does things completely different. They weren't going to run the Tommy Reese offense. Tommy Reese had to learn and run the Alabama offense. And because of that, I think Pete Golding should be far more familiar with Alabama's offensive looks in this game. Well, you took me exactly the question I was going to ask. Who gets the edge in that particular matchup? But I think you outlined it perfectly and succinctly in terms of how you're going about trying to assess some of the things that we've seen, given the level of familiarity there. So, Brad, I'll come to you for the last word on this particular game. As far as Ole Miss and Alabama, from where you had them rated coming into the season, I know the Crimson Tide took a ton of money from professional bettors under their win total when that number opened. At last check, the adjusted win total for Alabama was 8.5, and and I can't remember ever seeing one that low since Nick Saban (laughs) had this program built up. What have you done with both of these teams, knowing that Alabama clearly has an issue, or excuse me, they have a data point that we have concerns over with that loss to Texas, whereas Ole Miss, they go on the road, they beat Tulane in a backup quarterback there, they get outside the number late against Georgia Tech, but we haven't seen Ole Miss truly pushed by a team in their class. Yeah, so uh, Ole Miss, despite 3-0 and against a number with a cover margin of two touchdowns per game, barely an upgrade, uh, half a point for them, because I think they're extremely fortunate to be 3-0 and against the number. Uh, you know, I'm glad that they are because we had a best bet on this show and we had great information on that game against Tulane, but the reality was they were outplayed a majority of that game against the Tulane team with a backup quarterback. That final last week, very misleading. 27-17, middle of the fourth quarter. Somehow it's 48-23 final. Uh, so because of the last two weeks 
I haven't been super aggressive upgrading Ole Miss's power rating. Alabama, you mentioned it, already down on them coming in this season under a win total. I The first time I can ever recall betting under an Alabama win total. Downgraded them four and a half points since the start. And while this is sounding a little bit negative, maybe on the Alabama side, I didn't stop me from uh, betting Alabama this week. I thought that uh, really number was a little short. And despite the fact that I think Ole Miss is going to hit some explosives of offensively, there's still some concerns. I mean, we'll see if they can run the ball. And uh, for all the concerns about uh, the Alabama's offensive performance, I like the move to Milrow uh, back to him. So it, it didn't stop me from going ahead and laying the points here with Crimson Tide this week. Yeah, every now. I, oh, go ahead. Todd, Wait. I don't want to cut no, no, you no, no, off, go for it. but I thought that was that was awesome because as in my head as I'm playing back how we broke this game down, I was like, holy <laughs> yeah. shit, everyone's going to be running to the window here with an old Miss ticket. And I'm thinking to myself, that is not <laughs> – <laughs> Not kind yeah. of how I, how I feel about this one necessarily. Now, this almost, and, and I know you're you're well uh, versed in, in markets, Todd. This almost kind of feels like you know trying to catch the falling knife here. Like I, this could be the floor of of Alabama pricing here, and it looks like you know there's. I don't think it happens, but we're watching the market. There's a couple sharp shops that are kind of like trending a little bit off the seven. <sighs> It would be tough not to lay six and a half if it got there with Alabama. I think you'll know pretty quick, right? I, I really think you do. And I understand that um, Lane Kiffin has has given better Alabama teams trouble. Um, I haven't gotten to the window, but I, I just wanted, and thank God Brad said it, I haven't, the way we broke that down, I was like, holy <laughs> yeah. shit, everyone's going to be out here, largest bet of the year on, Miss, on Ole Miss Moneyline here. Yeah. So uh, thank you for that, Brad. Hey, this is one of those games, I think, when you look at Alabama's season to date, uh, and I'll use the literary term called a point of inflection, where if Alabama goes out there and loses this game to Ole Miss, you can bet against them because I don't think the market will catch up fast enough the way that they would have to downgrade them. But to your point, I'm not sure this is the game where you can buy Alabama stock arguably at its lowest price point not just this season but over the last couple of years you're going to be able to glean quite a bit of value unless you happen to have some inside intel that know that Alabama is a team that is going to struggle going forward and it'll make the next two road trips to Starkville against Mississippi State and then College Station against A&M that much more daunting than they could have appeared coming into the season. But friends, rest assured, we are not leaving the state of Alabama just yet. However, we're not talking Texas A&M. We're talking Auburn. We're going off the radar a bit for the Noun Powers 5 game that makes its reintroduction to our loyal podcast listeners. And Brad, you're taking us to the lovely hamlet of Jacksonville, Alabama, where it's the Jacksonville State Gamecocks welcoming a Mac foe in eastern Michigan. You look at Jacksonville State in this spot. They are a six-point favorite. Total in this game sits in the low 50s. Rich Rod clearly has this program headed in the right direction, something I never thought I would say, given what we've seen Rich Rod do at a variety of other programs while they make the transition going from the FCS to the FBS. But I'm to believe that you're a little bit more selling the Eastern Michigan side of things as Chris Creighton's team hasn't exactly lit the world on fire with their box scores or their limited offensive capabilities. Yeah, so we are going to go ahead and and lay it with the the home favorite here, Jacksonville State, minus six, and you couldn't have said it better. It's more of a play against Eastern Michigan than anything, and I'm not sure that the market has fully grasped how bad this Eastern Michigan team has been so far, and uh, it, mainly due to the fact they won nine games a year ago. They're still sitting here with a two and one record this year. They covered their in their only loss against Minnesota, but what I saw was pretty much three phony finals so far this year. Got out gained by Howard. If you don't pay attention to the FCS, Howard is a below average FCS team, and yet Eastern Michigan's getting out gained by more than a hundred yards in that one. They covered against Minnesota. I'm very thankful they did, <laughs> but my goodness. Minnesota failed at the goal line several times, including late in the game. They had a first and goal at the one, and if they punch it in, Minnesota gets the the cover. Doesn't happen somehow. Uh, but box score wise, Eastern Michigan outgained by, which I don't think is a very good Minnesota team this year, uh, by more than 250 yards. To me, that should have been like a four touchdown loss. Uh, against a plotting Minnesota offense, too. And then last week, I mean, UMass has certainly improved, but UMass is still a bottom five FBS team. And the reality is, at home, Eastern Michigan was plus three in turnovers and still only beat UMass by two at home. Uh, I mean, I just look, I'm pretty conservative with downgrades as far, and I love Chris Creighton as a coach, but my goodness, I, I'm not sure that the downgrade has been enough here on this team. And Jacksonville State's one of those transitioning FBS teams from the FCS. 
that the market, including myself, doesn't have a really good feel for their power rating. I thought they got outplayed by UTEP in the opener, but they still first game as an FBS team. They win. They beat a team that won a, you know, went to a bowl game last year. So I thought that was critical. They just did what they should have done, and the market loved them against the, the FCS opponent in week two. And then they outgained, went on the road and outgained Coastal Carolina. Pretty decent Coastal Carolina team on the road. So I think you know a new FBS team, they got a nice reset off a of bye. I, I I don't do this often, but man, it's not often that I think a six point favorite has. I I'm kind of confident, maybe possible blowout win. That's how I feel about this one. So it's pretty strong. It's interesting when you look at Jacksonville State. They've obviously played two quarterbacks so far this season, and against Coastal Carolina, you saw Zion Webb and Logan Smothers almost share the responsibilities. You wonder if this team has some of those same traits as James Madison did last year, where the betting market isn't quite sure how to respond to a team stepping up in class. And fortunately for Jacksonville yep. State, a residence in Conference USA, an easier road to go down than what James Madison dealt with in the Sun Belt. So no doubt a team to watch, and I think the way you highlight some of the concerns for Eastern Michigan. Look, in this business, you can play on teams or you can play against. Both strategies can be equally as profitable when you identify those opportunities. And this fits the bill for betting on a team that's undervalued against the team that has really struggled in some of the statistical categories we look at. All right, gentlemen, we've had a busy slate of college football, one that I think a lot of fans are excited about, but this arguably may be the crown jewel of them all. No offense to you, Payne. Will your day will either be made or broken by the time this game kicks off, depending on what unfolds between Florida State and Clemson. It's Ohio State and Notre Dame. It's the Buckeyes, a field goal favorite for their trip to South Bend, total in the mid-50s in this contest. And Notre Dame and Ohio State will meet as top 10 teams for the fifth straight time in the series, while the Buckeyes have won the last five meetings all by double digits when we look at Ohio State they're one and one in South Bend which is visiting for the first time since 1996 when the Buckeyes beat Notre Dame 29 to 16 as far as Notre Dame and Brad this number blew me away I couldn't 100% verify but I'm a little concerned is it true that Notre Dame hasn't beaten Ohio State since 1936 True, 0 and 5. So, I mean, it's a limited sample size, but I, I didn't know it was going to be close to 100 years for the last time that uh, Notre Dame had gotten there. But Marcus Freeman had some interesting comments, guys, coming into this game versus his tune last year, where he said they had to play keep away, they had to try and shorten the game. His thought process now with a veteran quarterback is they can be a lot more aggressive. They can go out there and play to win, as I'm paraphrasing here, more so than play just to not to lose. However, we'll get to Sam Hartman and what we expect on that side of the ball in a moment with Brad. But Payne, I'll start with you and Ohio State offensively in terms of figuring out what they have in a young quarterback who looked to finally feel a little bit more comfortable. Now, I know it wasn't a defensive heavyweight in Western Kentucky by any stretch of the imagination, but he goes out there, Kyle McCord does, goes 19-23 to for 318 yards, his second straight three-touchdown, no-interception game. Efficiency rating, the best of the season, yards per attempt, completion percentage, and it almost looked like a weight had been taken off his shoulders after Ryan Day named him the starting quarterback instead of refraining from saying it wasn't a quarterback battle between him and Devin Brown. Obviously, Ohio State has the playmakers at wide receiver. They have a talented stable of running backs, some questions on the offensive line. But do you trust a young quarterback matched up against an Irish defense that has a ton of veteran leadership, especially at the linebacker position? Well, the first thing, as a leader of men, way to excite Brad about talking about this game and, and you know throwing out the caveat that his favorite team hasn't won in this I'm trying to light a fire under him. Win <laughs> one for the Gipper since 1936. Maybe this is the year. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, offensively for Ohio State and and you're looking at this side of the matchup I think there's a lot of projection and opinion built into to this side because of what Ohio State's offense lost at key positions and what Notre Dame's defense lost along the D-line and neither have really been tested so far this season and you know, Ohio State's offensive line, we projected to take a significant dip this season. You, you lose the second overall pick at quarterback and both starting tackles. And that's showed pretty true to this point that, that there should be a downgrade here. You just look at some of the performances, very methodical in the opener at Indiana. Too many drives stopped before they actually got going. 40% of Ohio State's drives were three and outs against the Hoosiers. Didn't get a ton of push against Youngtown State before garbage time just a 38 percent rushing success rate with that three-headed monster in the backfield it just doesn't pass the sniff test to me and I know you know what you said at the top there about 
folks talking about Kyle McCord's confidence now being named the full-time starter and he doesn't have to look over his shoulder and he can play more freely. I, I agree to a certain extent, and I think people are kind of extrapolating that to the reason why he performed very well in his most recent game uh, against Western Kentucky. And, and listen, that was awesome. 66% success rate in the first half against the Hilltoppers. But again, it's just once in three games where Ohio State's offense exceeded expectation, and that Western Kentucky defense had to replace eight starters in his outside the top 100 in defensive efficiency. Okay, Notre Dame's defense hasn't been totally tested, although I think the data point against NC State probably the best of either of these units. Um, you obviously had the entire offseason to prepare for an option offense in Navy. CMU's offense is outside the top 100. NC State you know hostile environment had to deal with some starting and some stopping doing to, to weather conditions on the road which is you know kind of a, a mental test there but nc state doesn't have a ton of weapons and my suspicion is the Wolfpack offense finishes outside the top 50 this season but we had some questions about notre dame's front seven coming into the season right do they have the bulk inside to stop the run is there an edge rusher that can truly impact the game and we i think reference this specific game uh because of those tackle issues for ohio state but I think when you're looking at this matchup, that's where this thing comes into play. We absolutely loved the game plan Marcus Freeman and Al Golden came up with last season, right, in the shoe against a far more talented Buckeyes offense. And this might sound crazy to some, but I think Notre Dame's defense has to go the complete opposite route in this one. Be extremely aggressive. Put an extra man or two in the box. Send the the A and B gap run blitzes Al Golden loves so much, right? I'd prefer on passing downs a little more pressure off the edge in this spot personally, but you know, there aren't a ton of negative plays being created by the Irish front seven through three weeks. Just a 10% havoc rate. Stuff and runs at about a 17% rate, roughly average um, nationally, despite facing, you know, a below average schedule of offenses. So I would roll the dice, right? Man Marvin Harrison, impede him as much as you can at the line of scrimmage, force McCord to look elsewhere right away. Because if you look, McCord wants to get rid of it quickly. 2.3 second release time when he's kept clean and then provide some help over the top on Harrison but get that initial jam on him so it forces McCord to be out of rhythm some and, and make him read a different area of the field. It sounds scary, right? Man in the, the Buckeyes receiver group, so you can put more bodies in the box. But I think this needs to be the game where Marcus Freeman forces Kyle McCord to beat the Irish downfield. If at the end of this game, Notre Dame loses a grinder because Ohio State was able to run the ball, that's a fail to me. You have to make Kyle McCord show he can be the man and, and you look against two horrific defenses and one downtrending Indiana defense, Kyle McCord is 11 for 29 on throws 10 plus yards downfield with one of the country's best receiver groups. And over 10 percent of those 10 plus yard throws by McCord, they've been deemed turnover worthy. I just think in the biggest game of Kyle McCord's life to date, force him to beat you. And if he does, you, you just tip your cap and move on. I mean, Payne, look, if Ohio State has concerns about their starting quarterback, clearly the Irish should see their veteran starter as a step in the right direction and give them more stability at the position. It's obviously why you go out in the transfer portal, you bring in Sam Hartman to win games of this magnitude. And Brad, when we look at Sam Hartman, at least through the first couple of games as a member of this Irish team, he's gone out there and done exactly what you'd expect. He's put up crooked numbers. He's shown the ability to throw the deep ball. He's been good in terms of limiting some of the turnover worthy throws but this clearly now becomes a step up in class and when you look at an inexperienced offensive coordinator that Sam Hartman's paired up with against a DC that has come out and said he feels much more comfortable with what his players grasp he wants to do on that side of the ball who has the edge here Sam Hartman and Parker's offense or Jim Knowles and what the Buckeyes can do with a very talented linebacking core and a group that's built to get after the quarterback I think the latter uh, at least that's what my gut is telling me. But, you know, obviously I'll start with the Notre Dame side. You know, Sam Hartman's been everything and more to what Notre Dame uh, wanted when they, they went out and got him. Uh, how could you not? I mean, he hasn't thrown an interception yet. I'll jinx him there. But, uh, you know, the, the, he, from a leadership aspect, there's been a certain calmness uh, that, that we haven't seen from that position in Notre Dame in, a, in such a long period. It's an adult running the offense. Again, that we just, quite frankly, haven't seen since, like, Brady Quinn. I mean, that's going almost two decades at this point. I mean, leads the nation in passing touchdowns. Pushing the ball down the field, too. I mean, he's number four in yards per attempt. 
the quality of competition obviously hasn't been there. Um, and, and to me, something to keep an eye on because I do watch uh, Notre Dame quite aggressively. Took a couple of tough hits last week against Central Michigan. And I thought coming out of those couple of hits, he was hitting every single throw early in the game. Missed a couple of layups uh, that he's typically made so far this season after that shot that he took against Central Michigan. So that's something to keep an eye on there. Uh, I also think as good as Sam Hartman's been, Audrick Estime has been phenomenal at running back. Uh, He's the highest graded power five running back in the country last week. In fact, Pro Football Focus has him so far this season as the highest graded running back in the country. And I'm pretty critical of Notre Dame. I've kind of seen the same thing. This is a a kid that has certainly outplayed his recruiting ranking. He was a four-star kid, not to throw salt in the wound, was supposed to go to Michigan State. Notre Dame flipped him late in the process. Uh, He's always been kind of a bruiser, but I think he's shown some nice agility. He was hurtling players last week at his size. It's something that Notre Dame hasn't had too often at running back in the last 20 years. Uh, they do have a deep running back core. I talked about this in the Week Zero podcast. And they haven't been afraid to, to, to use those three other backs. Uh, three of them have 15 or more carries. I do expect that they'll be cautious and see a lot of estimate in this game. I'm not sure if they trust the, the, the freshman at running back yet in a matchup like this. Some concerns here. The, 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 as good as the numbers have been so far from the Notre Dame offense, since I do watch it with a fine-tooth comb, I'm really concerned about that interior of the offensive line. Guard, center, guard, to me, the rushing explosives haven't been there. Uh, I I think there's an opportunity that Ohio State can have some success. NC State, you go to that game, they had four sacks against the Irish. There was times where that Notre Dame offense was really bogged down, several three and outs in that game, and a lot of it had to do with the pressure that was coming uh, from that front, that NC State front, and I'm here to tell you, uh, as good as NC State's front is, Ohio State's much better. Uh, I think at left tackle, Joe Alts played the part, played like a first-team All-American. The right tackle, Blake Fisher, is disappointed. Uh, he's lost some weight. I, I mean, jokingly, I, I like fat uh, Blake Fisher more than I, <laughs> I do slim. Uh, he doesn't have that same punch or push that he had last year. So I'm concerned. You would think Notre Dame football all offensive line be fine. No, I mean, that's one of my biggest worries of the game. Tight ends and wide receivers have sur- surpassed expectations. I think it helps when you got a really good quarterback throwing you the football and not making mistakes and, and throwing you open. Uh, they, again, they haven't been tested that, 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 that much where they will this week. Uh, Chris Tyree's probably been a revelation. I mean, it's not easy to transition from running back to wide receiver, and he's you know averaging 27 yards per carry, finally getting him out in open field where he can show off his speed. Uh, Holden stays a tight end, uh, athletic kid, not going to why you in the run game, in my opinion, but uh, they've used him well. I, you talked about the Notre Dame off OC. I mean, Parker was kind of panned as a OC. So far, so good. I think there was a hire that was made that kind of, you know, for all the concerns there were, were about Parker, Gino Gadouli as a quarterback coach, a guy that has coordinator experience, uh, I think has been a, a pretty good addition that people nationally haven't talked about. You see him on the sidelines. He's constantly got the entire offense around him. He's kind of a calming factor uh, compared to what they had under Brian Kelly and Tommy Reese. Uh, a little bit different personality there. And it shows up, in my opinion. There, there isn't as much panic on the sidelines and discombobulation that there's been here in recent history. With that being said, I think one of the major stories that's probably not being talked about in college football, again, they haven't played anybody, but I – I'm buying into the Ohio State defense being improved. And they've been improved. I mean, since they the bottom fell out in 2020, they've improved every year. And obviously this year, the, the counting stats are there uh, as far as they've taken that next step uh, in a second-year defensive coordinator. And to me, it starts with if you follow recruiting. A couple years ago, Ohio State signed their best recruiting class in school history. And a couple of the highest-rated kids on that recruiting class were a couple of edge rushers. And to me, now that they're juniors, they're starting to come into their own. Jack Sawyer and JTT uh, really got after West Kentucky last week. Combined 13 quarterback pressures between the two. The pass rush grades were there. Uh, so if you got two edge rushers like that that are playing up to their five-star top 10 overall player in the country ability, they're going to be tough to block, even when Notre Dame has an All-American left tackle. Uh, Tyleek Williams on the interior has played well. Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg have so much experience. Now, can you win the national championship with those two? Maybe. 
Uh, but I can tell you one thing, uh, you can win a lot of football games with those two guys at linebacker. They've had more talented linebackers in the past, but th- those two are pretty solid for the Buckeyes. Denzel Burks played uh, better than what he did a year ago. The old Miss transfer's been fine. You'd like to see better stuff rate uh, on defense, but the success rates, the explosives are good. And to me, I test says this is a much better defense than what we've seen the last couple of years for the Buckeyes. So I know they're going to get tested from Sam Hartman. But my goodness, if they can get pressure on Sam Hartman, and I think they will, uh, I, I think Ohio State's defense might have the edge here. Look ahead number, Brad, on this game during the summer when it was first available, had the Buckeyes as a full touchdown road favorite in this spot. Have you seen that much from either of these two teams that we should be adjusting all the way down to another key number in a field goal? I mean, yeah, I have the Buckeyes by, you know, I bet Ohio State in those summer markets. Unfortunately, I got some bad numbers there, but i wasn't afraid to go ahead and go back to him here because I think there's been too much of an adjustment. And I'm a guy that's downgraded the Buckeyes three and a half points, uh, concerned about the offense, uh, especially a quarterback. Uh, and I've upgraded Notre Dame a point and a half, even though they played four, you know, three tomato cans and an okay NC State team. So, yeah, I, I've been, you know, somewhat aggressive for me as far as the power ratings adjustment. And I still got Ohio State four here. And I've, I've talked about it, uh, the, 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 I want to say going back to the summer, but. I, and it'll be the talk of college football and, and Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, come 7 o'clock on Saturday night. But this is going to be a split crowd. I'm telling you, Ohio State will have 20-plus thousand fans, maybe more, in, in attendance here. And uh, I, I've seen these throughout my Notre Dame fanship, and they normally don't go well for Notre Dame when the opposing team's fan base takes over. Hey, we know the Scarlet and Gray will travel in full force to South Bend to watch their team uh, in the shadows of Touchdown Jesus against the Fighting Irish. And clearly these two teams with a win here can really make one of the first major statements in terms of their ability to lay claim to being a legitimate national championship contender. So three hours after kickoff, we'll have a pretty good indication of exactly which program will be headed in the right direction and which one will have a little bit of soul searching still left to do. That isn't the final game, though. We'll get to on this glorious Saturday slate. However, gentlemen, one last game and a football hotbed in Happy Valley where Beaver Stadium will play host to Penn State and Iowa. It's the annual whiteout game. Penn State more than a two touchdown favorite. Total on this game sits at 40. When we look at Penn State, They've lost their last six games against ranked Big Ten rivals as well as eight of its last nine such games. Now, the majority of those come against the Ohio States and the Michigans of the world, so it's a little bit of a different dynamic here. When we look at this Iowa team, Cade McNamara was supposed to be a revelation. He was going to lead the Iowa offense into the 21st century. Not quite sure we're giving a full passing grade despite Coach Ferentz running up to score last week against Western Michigan to keep his son Brian ahead of their pace for that 25 points per game threshold he needs to keep his job when we look at Penn State 9-0-1 against the number over their last 10 games it's actually the longest active streak in the FBS without an ATS loss this however will be the largest spread between these programs since they met in 2017 and the biggest number that we have seen in quite some time between these programs Brad this Iowa offense it was supposed to be new it was supposed to be explosive they were supposed to have playmakers the more I watch Iowa offense, I realize a Tiger can't change its stripe, and it's, it's, it's the same old thing, and it's going to get to be more difficult knowing that they lost their top tight end to a broken leg. They're down some depth in their backfield, and when we look at Cade McNamara, he hasn't exactly looked like he's taken the next step in his evolution as a quarterback when it comes to some of his decision-making against the lightweights thus far in Iowa's schedule. Yeah, so i getting ready for this deep dive podcast uh Obviously, rewatch a lot of the games uh, to, to see if I can find something uh, n- quite noticeable that, that maybe can give us an edge or at least something to think about down the road or matchup specific. I got to tell you, of all the games I watched and prep for this podcast this week, the thing that stood out to me was Cade McNamara's health or lack thereof. I mean, he does not even look close to 100%. I'm not some trained professional. But my goodness, I mean, his knees look like they're ready to buckle at any time when he's trying to be mobile in the pocket. Uh, He can't. It doesn't look like he can get everything in, 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 you know, everything into a throw. I mean, I think that's part of the reason why, you know, it wasn't accurate even against a, a Western Michigan defense that leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, number 116 in QBR, 53.5% completion percentage, 
5.9 yards per attempt. So not only is he not completing passes, he's not pushing the ball down the field. So my goodness, I mean, a 21% success rate on passing downs, pathetic. Uh, there's also not many rushing explosives, even though I've kind of liked what I've seen from a couple of the, the running backs. Uh, LaShawn Williams has looked good, 9.1 yards per carry. Patterson, to me, flashed against Iowa State. Molten Kid had a couple of touchdowns against Western Michigan last week, a freshman. Uh, there's some things to like, but there's nothing really to like about the Iowa passing attack. And, and with Lachey out at tight end, obviously that, that's going to leave for a bigger role for Eric All, uh, the, the Stilianos kid. But, man, Lachey was their leading pass receiver, you know, even missing most of the Western Michigan game. The receiving grade pass routes are terrible, not even the top 100 in PFF. There's not a single wide receiver on the roster that would scare me if I'm Penn State. So, Obviously, we're, we're going to be talking about, uh, in my opinion, a Penn State team that's going to load the box here, to say the least, and that they can play pressure, man coverage on the outside. Uh, can Iowa's offensive line hold up? Yeah, I mean, that's been a positive. I think their center's really good. In fact, Logan Jones was the highest graded Power 5 center last week. The guard positions have been better, in my opinion, than tackle positions. So we'll see. I mean, I think that's the major question, Mark. Can Cade Mc McNamara – not make critical mistakes. Uh, how much pressure is he going to see? Uh, I think he's going to get a lot because, I mean, Penn State defensively, Manny Diaz might not be a head coach, but he's doing a good job here. The havoc rates are good on all levels of the defense. Success rates good on all downs, standard downs, passing downs. Uh, they're getting after the quarterback 10 sacks. They're allowing less than 55% completions. They have given up some explosives. But, again, I'm not sure you're worried about explosives when it comes to Iowa. Uh, the tackling hasn't been crisp, but I just – in my head, I'm, I'm, it's tough for me to get this out of my head, is Abdul Carter, uh, a freak athlete, 6'3", 250, can run. Uh, Isaac on the edge. Dennis Sutton on the edge against an immobile quarterback. I don't see a pathway to, uh, for success here for Iowa's offense. Has Penn State's defense, Brad, lived up to preseason expectations? We know this was supposed to be one of the best units in the country. Obviously, they answered the bell and then some last week, recorded four interceptions against Luke Altmaier in the Illinois offense, doing so for the first time since November 15th, 2014 against Temple. And we saw how effective they were creating those short fields, allowing the offense to turn those into points. This probably, as you said, won't be the offense that can test them. Uh, but has Penn State, at least to the eye test defensively, been what you thought they were going to be? coming into the year I'm not sure yet I'm not sure we're gonna know yet I mean you look at Iowa this week at Northwestern next week by UMass and then the Buckeyes on October 21st so you're gonna have to get back with me in about a month from now <laughs> uh, but yeah I mean they looked the part physically uh I will there's some concerns interior defensive line uh is still a concern for me uh, you know, they did lose some guys in the secondary. Again, they haven't been tested yet, so I'm not sure. I mean, West Virginia is not good offensively. So, man, it, it, it's kind of sad state of affairs that you got to wait till late October to really get a good feel. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be the case for a lot of these power programs yeah. unless they want to schedule an elite non-conference foe or kick off conference play a little bit earlier uh, than they normally do. Penn State offensively, Payne, this is a team that scored 30 points against Illinois, meaning that Penn State has now scored at least 30 points in 10 straight games. It's actually the nation's longest active streak. They lead the Big Ten in turnover margin of plus seven and is the only team in the Big Ten without a turnover thus far. They turned some of those turnovers into 20 points, and the Nittany Lions are now averaging a nation best 9.69 points off turnovers per game over the last two seasons. The reason I bring all of that up is because when you look at Penn State from an offensive standpoint, yes, they scored 60 plus against Delaware. Congratulations, you beat the fighting Joe Flacco's. But the ground game hasn't gotten on track, and I believe some smart college football minds suggest suggested that the offensive line could have problems creating holes for Catron Allen and Nicholas Singleton. But you look at Drew Allar and what he has at his disposal. I mean, there's one plus receiver, at least from what I've watched from Penn State, that leaves you brimming with confidence and in steps an Iowa defense that while probably a step down, will still be a st step down, I should say, from what we've seen in the past, still a step up from anything that Penn State has played so far this year. I think both of you just already handicapped this game. I saw everything Brad saw with Cade McNamara, and oh. it it's it's scary. And when you watch him attempt to throw the ball, he's not very confident, so he pats it like three, four times before he throws late. 
Uh, so I wonder how much Penn State's offense is going to actually have to do in this game. I would presume there's probably going to be some short fields. And I think, Todd, you hit it perfectly. It's We're projecting Iowa's defense to be down. I, I understand you can only play who's on the schedule. And, and no doubt Kirk Ferentz has built the Iowa program to where the defense has a baseline, right? The floor is extremely high. And the total of 40 indicates there isn't going to be some massive offensive outburst for Penn State. There are some respected college football minds that currently have Iowa as the number one defense in the country right now. I'm not one of them, but I, you know, and I'm interested to see what this looks like against an offense with a pulse because we can question Penn State's schedule faced, right? But you look for the Hawkeyes defense first three games. It's Utah State, it's Iowa State, it's Western Michigan. And those three have an average offensive efficiency rank outside the top 100 so far. I mean, Iowa State and Western Michigan have offensive success rates of 36 and 38% on the season. So Iowa has not played a soul on offense. And you look through each of the first three games with kind of a, a fine tooth comb, right? There's sectors in each of the first three games where Iowa's defense looks like it's lost two of the top 18 picks in the NFL draft and one of the more decorated corners in the Big Ten the last few seasons with third-round pick Riley Moss gone as well. I mean, Iowa's front seven only created a 6% havoc rate the first two games of the season. In the opener against Utah State in the second half on standard downs, Utah State had a 60% success rate. The the lowly Iowa State offense, 45% success rate on standard downs against Iowa. And against Western Michigan, Iowa gave up four explosive plays on the first four drives of the game. Two explosive runs and two passes that went for a 64-yard touchdown and a 43-yarder that led to a field goal. Um, we know Iowa was outside the top 90 in returning defensive production, and they only really brought in one impact transfer on the defensive side of the ball. So this is also a big step up in class for Iowa's defense, going from three offenses at Kinnick Stadium outside the top 100 on average to a top 25 Penn State offense in Happy Valley for a whiteout. So you know, it wouldn't shock me at all right if Penn State finds some level of success here that maybe hasn't been completely shown yet but i do think they're going to be the beneficiary of this this penn state offense of some short fields created by its defense I, I really believe that just based upon what i've seen from iowa's offense so far it's always interesting when east meets west in the big 10 we know they do things a little bit differently obviously iowa still has a path to win the division even if they were to go down in flames this weekend against penn state uh the, clearly when we look at the nittany lines they're going to need more out of that receiving room they're going to need to get the ground game on track they'll have to get drew alar going but fortunately when you have a defense that's opportunistic and creates some short fields it can oftentimes mask some of those potential offensive deficiencies that may exist through the month of september you can follow brad on twitter at at Brad Power 7. You can follow Payne there as well at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. Follow me on social media. Most importantly, as always, you can follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Always great information when you have games of the magnitude we're going to see this weekend, Payne. These are the kind of college football Saturdays where you don't have to text me and say you're not watching the amateur hour and you're going to save your viewing for Sunday. Will you actually watch these games in their entirety? I know you'll be glued to the edge of your seat noon Eastern on Saturday. I know the the picture you love to paint, but I will be watching these games. I've been watching you, more. To your credit, you've come years. around. You've become college guy over the last couple of years. It's been a slow process, but I applaud your evolution. Yeah, I mean, when you uh, bring Brad into the fold, you actually have to do a lot more work. Uh, iron sharpens there. iron in the college football realm. But yes, should be a, a very good day and get an idea of who the pretenders and the contenders are on a variety of fronts. Quite frankly, across the national landscape, it feels like a lot of these Saturdays in the past have been dominated by the SEC. Uh, but to know you have so many intriguing teams and good quarterback play in the Pac-12, it's good to see some of the national brands all getting an opportunity to take center stage. But all of And the- we need that, right? Because oh, for you're sure. right now asking yourself, Who's good? <laughs> I mean, I know the, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it back to Florida State last week because that's the team that looked like they almost lost the game outright. But again, I mean, it's 31-10, late third quarter, ball at midfield. You actually look at some of the other performances. I mean, Texas is struggling with Wyoming. Uh, and Ohio Rice. State is and not Rice. Good. 
Yeah. I mean, what what number has has Michigan covered this year? Alabama, we know what they're going through. So the the top tier teams right now have have certainly showed uh, some issues with not just one, but multiple data points throughout the course of the season so far. So we're kind of waiting for that team to emerge. Hopefully big games like this provide a, a very nice data point for us to take forward and, and say, hey, like these are the, the true contenders this season. Yeah. Not to go off on a tangent because we'll get to the best bet in a second. Uh, I will say this single most impressive performance we've seen this year Florida State week one against LSU knowing the magnitude of that game and I think that win will continue to hold up as LSU in my opinion is the team to beat in the SEC West given what I've seen but if we look at one team for their full body of work you know what teams impress me the most it's the Washington Huskies they haven't allowed any inferior foe to hang around. Penix has gone out there and exceeded expectations with 400-yard games. We knew about the receiving core. And while it hasn't been an elite schedule, they dispatched Boise with ease. They took care of Tulsa. They didn't cover because they took their foot off the gas. And then going on the road, albeit against the beleaguered Michigan State side, they did what a good team is supposed to do. You step on the throat early and don't allow them an opportunity to get up off the deck. I mean, it is a dynamic offense with a very good quarterback and a great offensive mind with DeBoer. It feels like, although not completely tested yet, it does feel like the defense has gotten to a point that's improved enough to make a run, especially when you look at some of the counterparts, right? Alabama struggling offensively, Ohio State struggling offensively, Florida State hasn't really been crisp on offense, Jordan Travis certainly has not been uber efficient and there's been some lulls in that performance so you're kind of wondering hey you know their defense improves a little bit doesn't look like there's a fantastic offense out there from some of the the top tier caliber teams that they could potentially be going against uh in the playoff it's going to make the the Pac-12, very interesting. That conference in general, I know you, you busted some balls earlier, but hey. It's been fun. Spent about 10 days out on the West Coast this summer. Uh, I'm not going to say I loved it, but, you know, I was out there. You don't love, so the bottom line is you don't, is, you don't, you don't love really anywhere. Good. You lo- you're you like to stay at home in your three-mile radius. It doesn't matter where you go. Travel <laughs> isn't truly in your DNA in any capacity. Well, I, I think I've been probably, uh, if, if we were to put the calculator on this the tabulator i've probably been in like i don't know 20 different cities so far this year oh you would be my guess you've been on the yeah, go I've been, I've been you're, you're, you're a, you're a man go. about town that's what happens yes. when you're a renaissance <laughs> man of sorts you have right, to try let's let's have let's to try and make your trips and uh mosey right, around the jab out there finish the jab and let's move all on. four right. corners of this country but speaking of washington we'll see if they have their hands full against the bad cal team knowing that justin wilcox has actually had a lot of success against this former program in the past a couple of one score games in recent years for better cal teams uh but you know pretty good Washington teams at the same way. All right, my friend. It's a good thing you you waited till Brad was off to take the Cal jab. Why? Is Brad he would if he would have refuted that. Yeah, he's high on Cal this year. I mean, I thought he was tweeting about how Cal looked terrible with their game against Auburn. I could have sworn I saw. I'm nearly certain he. Yeah, we talked about it this offseason. He was a buyer on Cal's win total over. He was a buyer against North Texas. I may have to. Te- I may have to. I may have to get his full. May Auburn. have to get his full take uh, offer. Hey, they did cover against Auburn. You know, I am a Justin Wilcox well, apologist. North Texas too. So you know, we'll see by, we'll, a, by a long mile. Well, I think it may have had a. It may have been more indicative of Auburn than uh, a buy on Cal, but that we'll find out this weekend against Texas M. All right, best bet portion. We've had a very hot hand thus far, and we've done it with a lot of giant killing so far with some of the marquee games. We haven't done any of the dumpster diving. Is this the week we finally go to the G5 for a best bet pain, or are we staying in the power conferences? As a content engine that likes to talk about what's really going on, that likes to dive into these games and these teams from a much higher level, we're taking it personally. That Colorado is getting all this love from CBS and ESPN and Fox. (laughs) Okay, joking aside, let's let's make this easy. Um, You know, we think the pricing is a little wrong here on on Colorado, Oregon. We touched on this game a little bit at the top. You're starting to see Colorado's offensive line deficiencies come full circle. Starting to see Shador Sanders struggle under pressure with a 20% passer rating there. Oregon's defensive line, while it might not be elite to an Oregon Dan Lanning um, stature that they they ultimately hope to have there, it's certainly good enough to get pressure on on Colorado and Shador Sanders, Sanders here. 
let's go ahead. Let's lay it in the first half. Colorado, um, Oregon minus 11 in the first half. Again, the biggest thing for us in this game is price. We make it higher. Um, I think you're also looking at Dan Lanning having the ability to prepare for a one-dimensional offense without one of its top playmakers and Travis Hunter. Again, we, we kind of put him at a value of of two points here, 1.25 on the defensive side, three quarters of a point on the offensive side. When I look at d- defensively, too, for for Colorado, I think that's that's their largest weakness. We saw Colorado State's offense march up and down the field through the air with a backup quarterback. Bo Nix is going to find some success here through the air. Right now, their lead corner for Colorado is Amarion Cooper. Very familiar with that situation. Had a great freshman year, kind of downtrended last year for Florida State. The Seminoles wanted to move him to safety this year because they felt like they had better corner options. He's now your lead corner going into Austin against a high flying pass attack. So I think Oregon's going to score and and score a big number here. And uh, yeah, you know, I think we saw some deficiencies for Colorado's offense last week as well. Right. I mean, how did they start that game? Slow, slow and slower when Mo Camaro is operating at 100 miles an hour along that Rams defensive front. Yeah. So let's get out. Lay it early here with with the Oregon Ducks minus 11 in the first half. Quack, quack. What's taken us a little while to get our pound of flesh from the Colorado Buffaloes. Listeners knew it was coming, and we had to go to a derivative market to be able to do so. Oregon off to a quick start. Hopefully it's 21 nothing in the blink of an eye, and we're able to kick back and watch the Ducks roll to victory over the first 30 minutes. All right, my friend, I uh, want to wish your beloved Florida State Seminoles the best of luck, unless I happen to find myself with a Clemson ticket in hand, and then I'll keep my mouth shut, but uh, I don't see that yeah, coming I down. See th- doing that once it got to three. I don't see that Just coming down the shoot quiet. right now yeah we'll see i mean uh <laughs> i like to pull in harmony with you the fact that brad is conflicted from his wallet and his emotions is always an entertaining paradox in and of itself for that notre dame ohio state game uh but look this is what makes college football great and we know for guys that do it professionally you have to separate your heart from your emotions and you can always make more money there may not be an opportunity for notre dame to buy back a win against ohio state down the road uh, and we'll see all things line up for florida state as well if they're able to get a win against clemson no out in the catbird seat not just in the acc uh but also in their quest to make the college football playoff so enjoy the games this weekend any final words of wisdom parting shots things you'd like to share with our loyal listeners back tomorrow with the nfl hopefully we can get that as steamy as college has started yeah we will turn that ship around in no time at all best of luck to all of you the bet the board listeners with whatever you choose to do at the betting window this weekend and with an oregon first half ticket in hand come saturday afternoon we'll see you at the window we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of bet the board make sure you follow todd and Payne on x Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T-O-D-D-F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P-A-Y-N-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.